Hello, I'm John Rossi, a touring drummer with a love of all things animal. When I'm on the road, I visit as many zoos, aquariums. Hey, wait a minute. What's going on? Hey, what's going on there? Hello? Hello? We interrupt your regularly scheduled program to bring you Rossafari Zoo News. News you can use from the world of zoos and conservation. Every week, we bring you breaking news and analysis from around the globe, featuring the animals you love and the people who care for them. And here's your anchorman, John Rossi. Hello, 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 and welcome back to another episode of Rossafari Zoo News. We're bringing you the latest in the world of news as it pertains to zoos, aquariums, conservation, and general animal weirdness. I'm excited to have you all here, and uh, as you are listening to this, I am on a multi-day adventure in Ohio. And for once, it's not my crazy career that has brought me here, but Zoe's. She's got a behavior rotation at a behavior clinic outside of Cleveland, uh, which is different than the Cleveland Clinic. Um, That was a really lame joke, unless you know people who have been in the hospital a lot, and fortunately, thanks to my grandparents, I do. But um, anyway... So I decided to travel along, and while she goes and does actual work, I'm going to be visiting. Visiting the Cleveland Zoo, the Akron Zoo, the Cincinnati Zoo, and the Columbus Zoo. Uh, Will there be interviews? Oh, there will be interviews. Not necessarily at all of them, but uh, we'll be getting some good content. But also, you're just going to get lots of cool animal pictures from these places and and all the good Rossafari stuff. So make sure you are following along at Rossafari on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter at Raw Safari Pod on TikTok. And remember, if you want to be a part of these Zoo News episodes, you can be by tagging me in Zoo Newsworthy Stories on those apps or DMing them to me on said apps or by emailing them directly to me, rossafaripod at gmail.com. Today's episode is brought to you by Daydreamer Studios. Do you have stories and expertise to share with the world? Have you ever thought about starting your own podcasts? There's no better time to start than now with the help of a trusted production partner. Daydreamer Studios is a full-service production company that takes all the stress off your plate. You can focus on creating engaging content while they focus on recording, editing, audio engineering, hosting, and publishing on 22 platforms. Log into the advanced remote system with one click and the Daydreamer team will be on the other end ready for you to record everything you have to say. Owned and operated by Daydreamer Network, Daydreamer Studios continues on the company's mission to empower storytellers of all kinds by making podcasting accessible to all. For more information and current promotions, visit daydreamernetwork.com slash studios. All right, so before we get to the actual news this week, I thought I would uh, start off with a little funny story from my life. Um, You know, every once in a while, I think it's easy to uh, (laughs) kind of look around and make fun of something without looking at yourself or whatever and um, realizing you do the same thing. And I had a bit of an example of that recently. So I don't know if y'all listen to the Smartless podcast. Uh, It's a really fun, it's a like, you know, celebrity interview type thing. But what makes it so great is that the three hosts are Will Arnett, Jason Bateman, and Sean Hayes. And, you know, I don't really know much about Sean. I never watched Will and Grace, but he's he's all right on there. Um, But Jason and Will, I mean, I love me some Arrested Development and BoJack Horseman, and I'm just a huge fan of these two guys. And all three of them are really great friends. And then they pick on each other a lot. And there's a lot of inside goofiness, even during the interviews, which, uh, as you all know, I like some inside baseball and I like goofiness. But um, they end every episode by trying to find a creative and dorky way to get into saying the word bye, which they then do by going something like bye, but they always have to come up with a silly, funny way to get to the syllable. Like they'll say, oh, and I forget who's our president. Oh, that's right. It's Joe Biden. And, um, you know, I don't know. I always, I always thought it was weird. It makes me laugh sometimes and it's funny, but I was like, gosh, how do you get to such a weird ending to a, a podcast? Yep. Yeah. You guys know where I'm going with this. Uh, At least you do if you make it all the way to the end every week. Uh, I'm the guy who uh, reminds people every every week. 
that the word credits backwards is Steiderk and that the words Newsy credits backwards is Steiderk you sweat. Every week. Yep. And yet I was making fun of the people saying bye weirdly. So, um, <clears throat> yeah. Ironically, now it makes me laugh and smile more when I hear them ending their podcast that way because it makes me think of Steiderk and the Rossafari community and everything that we've built here uh, in the last, you know, it's almost been two years now, but still not quite. And uh, I'm just so grateful for y'all and so thankful. And um, yeah, so I just wanted to share that story. And with that said, Let's get to the news. One, two, three, four. Oh, there's a funky monkey, tree kangaroo, or a binturong. It's Zoo News. Yeah. All right. So um, we're going to start off Zoo News with a bit of a scary topic, and uh, it really could go in any and all of the categories, but um, I wanted it at the top of the episode. So uh, in Wisconsin, and I'm hearing now maybe in other places as well, it has been confirmed that wild red fox kits have tested positive for a strain of the highly pathogenic avian influenza that is currently affecting domestic and wild bird populations in North America. These are the first known mammals that have been infected by this strain of the uh, disease, and this is really scary, y'all. As I'm sure you've noticed if you've gone to any zoos lately, or, you know, if you've listened to zoo news, uh, most birds are being taken off exhibit at zoos. They're being put into places where they cannot interact with any of the wild birds since so many of them have this disease and it is so highly infectious. Uh, if this can get into mammals, this is a real scary problem. Now, it is believed, although we are not sure, that the way that the uh, foxes contracted the disease was through eating birds, possibly birds that had already died from the disease, but, you know, they still they had the disease. But the fact that it was transferred into the foxes is definitely scary. I mean, think about this. If zoos are pulling their birds because they can get infected from wild birds, will they have to start to pull any mammals that might eat or interact with the birds? Uh, this this can get pretty scary, pretty heavy, pretty quick. So um, we'll definitely have to keep an eye on this. It is a breaking story as I'm recording this. And uh, so far, there are only a few cases confirmed and a few others suspected. Uh, and I believe it's only foxes. Um, as, of, as of Sunday, May 15th, it's only foxes that are confirmed. But with that said, normally if something can get into foxes, it can get into other things. And you know that foxes are pretty closely related to dogs. So just as a safety precaution, your buddy John is going to say that when you're walking your dogs, make sure that they're not interacting with any uh, birds or bird corpses that they may find. Um, uh, probably a pretty pretty fair thing to do all the time, but uh, I'd, I'd highly recommend it right now because it would be a, a darn shame to lose Fido to a disease that we thought was only affecting birds. We'll be keeping an eye on this one, y'all. And while we're on the subject of less than happy news, uh, the Detroit Zoo, to follow up from last week, has officially suspended the search for their wallaby Joey that had gone missing. Uh, at this point, there's no reason to believe that the wallaby would have been able to survive without a veterinarian or, you know, its mother. And um, most likely, as they suspected, a bird uh, of prey caught it and, and took off with it. And that is a darn shame. So condolences to everyone at the Detroit Zoo. But that's really it for the bad news in the Zoo News section this week. So that's exciting. Um, and let's get to some really good, really cool news. There is a brand new baby animal at the Nashville Zoo. And I'm guessing it's one that you have never heard of before. This is the first ever spotted Fanaloka that has been born in the United States. Fanaloka are a lesser known small carnivore from Madagascar. Uh, honestly, this looks kind of like a little, almost, I don't know, cheetah kitten mixed with a fox. It's uh, it's really cute. Go to at Nashville Zoo on any and all of the social medias to, you know, take a look because you're going to want to see it because A, adorable, B, species you've probably never heard of, and C, in the official photos where they announced it, it is cuddling a stuffed animal that is larger than it is and it is adorable on just every level. 
So yeah, this is really exciting. The uh, the pup is a male, and the parents recently arrived at the zoo, uh, where they'll be living behind the scenes. These three are the only known Fanaloka to live at an AZA facility in the United States. Nashville does so much amazing, cool breeding stuff and works with so many rare species, although this is rare on a whole new level. Uh, I just think it's so cool. I love the Nashville Zoo so much. Um, and yeah, you can go, you can check it out. And if you're near Nashville, the pup is actually visible at the uh, veterinary hospital because they have these like windows and you can go up and they do nursery stuff up there. And um, that's where I actually first saw uh, Lucille, the bear cat at Cincinnati and and Datu, the, the binturong, also known as a bear cat, same species here, folks, uh, at San Diego, who I've gotten to know as adults and also the rest of their kin when they were little, little babies. It was the cutest thing ever. Highly recommend anytime you're at the Nashville Zoo, taking the trek to the vet hospital and seeing if anything's in the nursery. A giraffe that was born three months ago at the San Diego Zoo Safari Park was born with unstable wrist joints, which caused her front legs to bend improperly. The giraffe, by the way, is named Satuni, and uh, wildlife care specialists needed to jump in quickly to save her life. And uh, what they did was they partnered with orthodists at the Hangar News to design custom leg braces. They're really cool. Check this out. Hit up the San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance to see pictures. Satuni was in the hospital for nearly 40 days, at which point she was strong enough to reunite with the uh, draft tower at the safari park. And um, she's doing great, walking around with her leg braces and being an adorable giraffe. So uh, this is just another amazing example of the lengths that these incredible facilities go to to take good care of their animals. Love it so much. And yes, you need to go see pictures. It's adorable. The Santa Barbara Zoo recently announced that Jasmine is doing well. Congrats to everyone at the... Oh, wait, I should probably tell you who Jasmine is. So Jasmine is a fennec fox that lives at the Santa Barbara Zoo. And last April, poor Jasmine was diagnosed with an oral melanoma when she was reported to not have her normal appetite or activity level. The mass was not able to be completely excised when they tried to remove it due to its location in the back of the mouth, um, but they did get rid of most of it. The sad news is that typically, uh, we don't have a lot of studies for fennec foxes, but dogs get diagnosed with this disease fairly frequently and usually only live a few months after the fact. Well, the team at the zoo teamed up with Dr. Budrekis, a veterinary oncologist, to start Jasmine on a melanoma vaccine treatment. Uh, this was a treatment that was originally developed for people, but has been used in dogs for many years now with a fair to moderate success of both improving longevity and also, more importantly here, uh, improving the quality of life for the animal. Uh, now, here's the really cool part. It's six months later. She just got a booster and there are still no signs of new mass growth. Um, this is a big deal. This means that it's been over a year since the initial diagnosis. And not only is Jasmine still alive and kicking, but there are no other signs of issues or, or regrowth or anything. This is a huge deal. Um, there is no other documented case of fennec foxes trying this treatment. <laughs> okay, I guess that gives a little too much agency to the fox. A better way to put it would be that there are uh, no examples of fennec foxes being given this treatment. But regardless, uh, it seems to be going really well. So what does this mean for the future of fennec foxes with melanoma? Who knows? How well will Jasmine do and for how long? Who knows? All we know right now is that this is an incredible success story. And congrats to everyone involved. So on this podcast, we often talk about the importance of good signage at zoos and aquariums, and the Cleveland Metro Parks Zoo is currently making sure that they have some really good signage up in their gift shop. So this is kind of interesting. Uh, they've been working to have sustainable retail practices at the Cleveland Metro Park Zoo, and they wanted to encourage the people that are coming in there to notice the efforts and hopefully make some of their own to move towards a more sustainable shopping method. Uh, 
As such, they've put up a sign that says you make a difference by supporting these products you've saved. And then they go into their statistics. 572,728 plastic grocery bags, 285,480 plastic water bottles, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's really cool. I'm not going to give you all the stats, but they go through them and they are encouraging their uh, shoppers to both feel a sense of pride and ownership for the work that the Cleveland Metro Park Zoo is doing in this area, and also to hopefully adapt some sustainable behaviors of their own. Very cool. The Bronx Zoo in New York City has started a breeding program to help with wild bison restoration. This year, six bison were put out into the wild on the Osage Nation Ranch just outside of Pawhuska, Oklahoma. This is actually the second time that the Bronx Zoo has been involved in a bison reintroduction program. Uh, The first one stopped back in the 1950s, and uh, it's cool that they've started it up again. This is is pretty exciting. Um, I feel like so many people in the anti-captivity world love to say that zoos never actually reintroduce animals into the wild. And we talk on this podcast a lot about the fact that They rarely do, and that's because of a bunch of factors, including the big one being that there really isn't such a thing as, you know, the wild anymore for most of these animals. It's a real issue. Um, But this is a great example, just like the California condor out in San Diego, of uh, zoos doing just that. And, you know, there are so many more. You've heard about so many different programs like this on the podcast. I hope if you ever end up discussing this stuff with people who are anti-zoo that you re- remember the the rattlesnakes up in uh, New England or the, the hares up there or um, these bison or the uh, black-footed ferrets that we've talked about. There are so many cool reintroduction programs that zoos are doing and uh, they just don't get enough attention, which I guess is one of the reasons I, I do this podcast. It's pretty cool, y'all. And from something that's pretty cool to something that really doesn't matter at all, but hey, whatever, we'll talk about it. Um, USA Today is again doing their top 10 lists that you can vote on. These include top 10 zoos, top 10 aquariums, top 10 botanical gardens. Um, I think there's a top 10, they call them safari parks or something like that. Um, And, you know, we talk about this every year. And yes, when the top 10 drops, I'm totally going to do a Zoo News episode where I talk about it and we go through it because it is newsworthy, I guess, or whatever. But, um, you know, most zoos don't care. San Diego is almost always on these lists, but almost always near the bottom because they just never ask anyone to vote. Meanwhile, I will tell you, I'm a member of the Cincinnati Zoo, and y'all know I love the Cincinnati Zoo. Um, And as being a member, I I get to be in the membership headquarters, which is a closed group on Facebook. And y'all, there are people reminding you to vote every day, multiple times a day in there. And so, yes, Cincy is is probably going to win or maybe be number two, because also our friends at the Fort Worth Zoo are constantly reminding people to vote and asking and begging for those votes because, you know, they care. They want to use it to promote. I remember when I did my episodes from there, um, they they had a big sign up saying number one zoo in the country. And like, that's cool if you want to use it for marketing. Like, I totally get it. Uh, But it's a popularity contest. Here's the crazy thing. Okay. So y'all know I've been to over 170 zoos, aquariums, safari parks, whatever, all the different things that I go to. Um, I still have not been to every one of the 20 nominated zoos for this top 10 list. I think I'm at 19 now, which is pretty impressive. And I got to drive past the 20th one, which is kind of cool, I guess, maybe. But uh, I still have not been there. And if I have not been there, then I promise you most of the people voting have not been to many or in some cases any except for their local zoo that they're voting for, which is cool. But like it's a popularity contest. It means nothing. But uh, you know, if you want to go vote, vote. I won't stop you. <laughs> on my on my little uh, note that I make to go through the order of the stories and remind myself to say all of the stories that I have set aside, I, I normally put like pretty detailed stuff for me to follow and remember the story. And here I was just like, vote for the dumb thing if you care. So if you care, go vote for the the dumb thing. 
And yes, I, I will be accepting all messages when I do the episode, when the top 10 comes out, uh, reminding me how I was so critical and then was spending a bunch of time on another episode reading the top 10 list and talking about it. But y'all, I put out two episodes a week and I need content. So sometimes a little hypocrisy is necessary. <laughs> and speaking of not hypocrisy, but entertainment, um, both the Columbus Zoo show, Secrets of the Zoo, and the Disney show that goes behind the scenes at Animal Kingdom are coming back. As a matter of fact, the first episode of season five of Secrets of the Zoo, Columbus, uh, has already been released as you are listening to this, and the Disney one will be coming out soon. So if you enjoy watching the Rasafari podcast only with better hosts and video, you should check those out. You may actually recognize some of the people in season five of Secrets of the Zoo. Maybe. Maybe a guest. Maybe two. Maybe maybe someone else. Yeah. All right. We'll be back after this quick break. Check out the new nature podcast that everyone is talking about. Birds of a Feather Talk Together. If you like Radiolab or Planet Earth, you'll love Birds of a Feather Talk Together. Escape from the daily grind into the world of birds. Two experts and two amateurs talk about a different species every week. Recently, we talked about the osprey, burrowing owls, roadrunners, pigeons, giant hummingbirds, house wrens, sandhill cranes, and so many more. We have a lot of fun every week. Learn more about the incredible birds around you and some that you didn't know existed. Birds of a feather talk together. You're going to like these birds. I guarantee it. We'll see. Because, like, seriously, until you're actually on the air, you don't know if you're going to be in a show or not. But let's just say, not me, but some names you'll recognize are going to be on that thing, and it's awesome. And that brings us to... Stereotypical Animal Podcast Theme Song. Here to bring you to Conservation News. All right. It's a new week, which means we need new stories about red wolves. And we're back to a sad one this time. A federally protected red wolf was found dead in Tyrell County in North Carolina. And uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services are begging anyone to provide any information they may have about what happened to the wolf. See, this wasn't some natural injury. The wolf was shot in the spine, and even sadder than that, it was left to die. It didn't die from the gunshot wound immediately, but instead collapsed into a field of mud where it drowned in the mud. I'm sorry to be so graphic, but this is how much some people hate red wolves. This is the struggle that the red wolf reintroduction program is having. And it's just disturbing and disgusting. People do not understand this amazing, gorgeous species. And I hate, I hate it. 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 I debated so long whether or not to actually share what happened, but I think it's good to understand that this is what we're fighting as we try to protect wolves. Um, the uh, Fish and Wildlife Service is offering a $5,000 reward for information that leads to the successful prosecution of the asshole who, I mean, excuse me, I'm a professional newscaster here, of the culprit. And uh, while we're on sore subjects, uh, this next story comes out of Australia, but don't worry, I'm not going to do my goofy accent or, or get Ren involved or anything here, because this is a really good or really bad story, and I don't quite know what to make of it yet, but it's breaking and I want to share it with y'all. Uh, so the, the crux of the story is that Aussie Arc, which is a um, conservation organization that I really have loved and respected in the little bit of, you know, what I've seen about them. I've reported on them uh, on here before. They have reintroduced the Tasmanian Devil to mainland Australia, and it has been wildly successful. They also have what, to my eyes and understanding, um, is fairly successful positive, good ecotourism that is raising money to help save devils and other species that are endangered in Australia uh, and is being done in a good way and is not profiteering or anything like that. So all of this seems very positive. Uh, 
And so recently, Aussie Arc announced that um, they were taking steps to save the critically endangered Barrington Broadtooth Rat. Um, they said that they partnered with the government of New South Wales to um, survey remote sites in which they are found and then find six individuals that they took out of the wild into a captive breeding program for reintroduction and to save the species. Okay, now, y'all know I have no problem with that kind of thing when it is done to save a species. This is different than taking an animal out of the wild just to shove it in a zoo like AZA facilities don't do anymore and all that good kind of stuff. Um, this is, this is the California condor story at San Diego all over again, only with the rat. And I'm, I'm excited and I'm happy. And that's so cool. And I'm so proud of Aussie Ark for doing this amazing thing. Dot, dot, dot. Until I then read that the National Wildlife Parks Service of Australia has launched an investigation into Aussie Ark because they claim that uh, the broad-toothed rats that were collected, it was done so without the appropriate authority and that the government of New South Wales never agreed to this or partnered with Aussie Ark for this collection. As part of the investigation, compliance officers have seized 135 traps that were discovered in the uh, national park where these rats were collected. Um, and they are claiming that they are going to refer the matter to the Commonwealth to possibly prosecute uh, any breaches of the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act of 1999. We have been and are at all times legally compliant. Aussie Arc has been licensed by the department and transparent with the project since July 2021. We look forward to this now becoming a public discussion and will issue a statement in coming days in defense of our critical programs preventing extinctions. Aussie Arc reiterates its public-private partnership with the NSW government to save wildlife from extinction and repopulate wild spaces. I'll keep y'all posted on exactly what happens with all of this, but uh, here's hoping that they're able to figure it all out and just save the rat, because that's what really matters, y'all. Some good news from the waterways of America. For the first time in seven years, Missouri sturgeon are spawning. This is actually a pretty big deal because uh, sturgeon are critically endangered in Missouri, and um, it's very much been a problem because they're not breeding very much because they really don't like what's going on with the uh, Missouri and Mississippi River in the state. Um, in general, the fish tends to really like firm bottoms of sand, gravel, and rock that are silt-free, and the rivers haven't been providing a lot of areas like that because of pollution and other issues. However... Because of some protected waterways, it seems that the uh, the bottom of the rivers, both the Missouri and the Mississippi, are cleaning up a little bit. So much so that sturgeon are spawning for the first time in seven years. Hmm. Seven years sturgeon spawn. Say that three times fast. Seven years sturgeon spawn. Seven years sturgeon spawn. <laughs> nope. And that bit of stupidity leads us to... It's time for other news. It's time for other news. Hey, no, right now, right now, it's time. It's time for other news. Hey, it's a segue to the park on other news. Okay, so I know that it's common to believe that fishermen lie about the size of their <clears throat> catches. But uh, in this case, this one was caught on video, so uh, it is true. A Texas fisherman caught a 300-pound, 8-foot-long alligator gar. And the cool thing is, it was catch and release, so that alligator gar is back in the water living its best life. The man who caught the fish is named Peyton Moore, and uh, he took some measurements of the fish before releasing it, as well as all kinds of video and pictures and stuff. Um, but because he did not keep it and chose to let the gar live rather than 
end its life, he will not be able to get the state record for largest fish caught, which is a shame because he totally would have earned it based on his measurements. But uh, I really admire the fact that the dude let it go and continue living rather than seeking out that kind of glory. I I believe in that world that would be considered glory. And uh, so, yeah, uh, pretty cool. Big fish, let go. Yay. Animal, animal, animal holidays. Animal, animal, animal holidays. All right, friends. So it is May, and that means it is still National Lake Cleanup Month and National Duckling Month. And then this week starts with Friday, May 20th, which is National Rescue Dog Day, Endangered Species Day, and World Bee Day. Keep in mind that the last three days had no animal holidays on them. I'm going to keep beating that drum until these get spread out more. But anyway, uh, Saturday the 21st is World Migratory Fish Day and National River Cleanup Day. Sunday the 22nd is the International Day for Biological Diversity. Monday the 23rd is World Turtle Day. And Wednesday, the 25th, is World Otter Day. And those are your animal holidays for the week. So there you have it, folks, your weekly episode of Zoo News. I would like to say thanks to Laura Shank, my Red Panda level patron, and remind you all that if you'd like to support the podcast, you can do so at patreon.com slash rossafari. There's now even a full bonus episode that patrons have access to and lots more goodies coming down the road. So uh, go support the pod that way. And whether you want to do that or not, you can also support this podcast by sending in these stories. Like I mentioned, I'd like to thank the people who did that this week. Anya Keen, Colleen Lenahan, Kim Cooley, Kristen Khalil, Carrie Kirkpatrick, and Emily Rockbuck. Thank you all so very much. That was a whole lot of C's and K's, y'all. Goodness gracious. Anyway, friends, I will be back with you on Tuesday, and it's going to be a very exciting episode because we are going to Happy Hollow Zoo, and you're really going to enjoy my guest. I can't wait to share this one with you. It is a position at a zoo that we've not had on before, and that's all I'm going to say for now. Well, that, and to remind you that the words newsy credits backwards are Steiderk Yiswen. The Rossafari Podcast is produced, hosted, and engineered by John Rossi. Editing and fact-checking by John and Dr. Zoe Vesley Gross. Our theme song is Sevens by Nathan Burke, performed by Nathan and John. Interrupting John theme and additional voices by Taylor Isaac Gray. You can reach John directly on Instagram and Facebook at Rossafari or by email at rossafaripod at gmail.com. Rossafari is part of the Daydreamer Media Network. Now, stop listening to me and go visit a zoo.